Once I talk with Jamie Stewart from the group Shoot Shoot, we're going to start with um, some of the questions about the new album, Ignore Grief. It's out on uh, March the 3rd, I believe. Uh, and then we'll move to some more general miscellaneous questions. We've also asked um, on, on our social media people to submit questions to us. We've had loads and loads of responses, some really, really good questions. I'll try and ask um, as many as possible, if that's okay. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Jamie. How's it going? Oh, I'm doing okay. Sorry, I'm slightly harried today. I'm sorry, I'm a few minutes late, but I am here all as well. Uh, no, no. I mean, now all as well that I'm here and not doing the BS I was doing before. So thanks no, no, again. No, it's absolutely okay. We we really appreciate you you joining either way, and and we're really really glad to have this uh, talk with you. Um, so yeah, I guess my our first question is on the new. So talking about the new record, you sing half the songs on there while Angela sings the other half. Is that correct? Yeah, what made you decide to split the album like that? Um, <laughs> Angela just said, I want to sing half the songs. I, there was a lot of stuff on it. I was, I was working on lyrics. Uh, we uh, uh, share a house, um, and um, she walked into the studio we also share and just said, just declared it, and I looked at her. And she has a very, uh, un, an unusual, very specific a uh, voice that I think we haven't um, uh, used enough. Um, so uh, it sounded like an excellent idea uh, to me. I immediately agreed. Yeah, absolutely. She, about it. she, she had only sung on one song, and that was hmm. 10 years ago or something. Um, so it was it was a, a, chal uh, a challenge for her, but something I've always really appreciated about her is she's, she's always up to push herself. No, absolutely. That sounds great. Um, so you mentioned that you've recorded in your home studio. What's it like sort of working in the same place that you live? Oh, uh, I've, I, I haven't really done it any other way, save for I moved to Berlin a couple of months ago and buried for like two months or something at a workspace that wasn't where I lived, which is the only time that I have ever done that. Um, I think for the first week, I thought it was a little charming to kind of like come home from the office or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then I thought it was an enormous pain in the ass wasting an hour a day commuting. So um, uh, I think largely I really appreciate the opportunity to work on things whenever I want to, which is generally all of the time. Yeah. Um, there is something to be said for closing the door and having the day be done. Mm. Uh, rather than realizing it's one o'clock in the morning and there's something you still have to fuck around with yeah. um, and not going to bed. But uh, I mean, I don't know, I've done it this way for 20 years, so I I feel fortunate to have been able to. No, absolutely. Um, and you mentioned uh, that you, you guys moved to Berlin. I am, one of the questions that we got asked, um, which I thought was pretty great, was what do you miss about the US and what do you not miss about the US? Um. It's kind of funny. It's really like all the really important things in life, such as physical safety, yeah, uh, <laughs> um, you know, a working infrastructure, a functional society. Um, the opposite of those things, I don't miss about the United States <laughs> at all. Um, but um, and this is going to make me sound like such a dick. I really miss the food. The food in Berlin is really bad. Oh, yeah. It's not inedible. It's just sort of a non-event, essentially. Whereas Angela and I are both totally obsessed with eating, and Los right. Angeles, where we both grew up and lived, is one of the best food cities in the entire world. I'm becoming to realize now that it's far, far away from me. Um, I miss the variation in topography. You know, the desert is close, the ocean is close, and this is just California. It's not like this in the whole United States. Yeah, fine. Um, the mountains are close, and um, while Germany is very beautiful, the topography is relatively uniform, but, uh, so I miss that. But all the grown-up things, I really appreciate very, very much about Berlin. They're boring, but <laughs> no. I'm sort of like dating somebody who oh. is, is, like, Los Angeles is sort of like dating somebody who's insane. Yeah. Um, and mean to you, but the sex is really good. And Berlin is kind of like dating someone with like a really good job, who's really stable from a nice family, but um, you it's a little bit boring. Like, you know that they're good for you and you're yeah. trying to do the right thing for yourself. So um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like that. 
No, absolutely. And a lot of, obviously, a lot of really, really famous albums and art have been recorded in Berlin and many, many artists have chosen. Like, oh, the... I mean, I mean, I'm kind of making fun of it. I mean, legit, Berlin is a legitimate art city. Um, oh, I just I just moved here. So, you know, it's only been a couple of months. I have a little bit of homesickness, but oh yeah, no, that's... Um, I, I, I'm absolutely certain it's the right thing. And and there's a, there's an art group that we work with here all the time uh, called Cheap. Um, and it's really, it's spectacular to get to be around. Yeah. Um, a lot more they're extraordinarily talented and um the members are genuine art heroes of mine so it's a huge honor to get to participate and work with them that's fantastic do you think the uh music scenes there's a difference in the music scenes between you know america and berlin yeah the experimental scene in berlin is much more established and much more supported sure. um it's uh Basically, like the experimental scene in Los Angeles is largely pretty DIY, I suppose, yeah. which in some ways is great. Um, uh, I mean, it, it affords a certain type of uh, grit, I suppose, um, yeah. whereas the experimental scene in Berlin is very supportive. And I mean, I wouldn't say that it's mainstream, but I mean, the, you know, the government pays for a lot of it. So sure. in some sure. ways it is totally mainstream. And in that way, it's much more spread out um and you know by experimental i mean like totally experimental like you know like dropping a wine glass on the ground and rolling around in it kind of experimental yeah cool um so those those things are quite different i mean as far as like the other scenes outside of that i don't really know very much about that's fair no absolutely so back to the uh the new album um for this album david kendrick who's worked with uh bands like i think devo and sparks um joined the band and as uh collaborator on the album um do you think his experience with these kind of bands has kind of shaped the record not this particular record so much hmm. um i mean in in that i i mean those bands uh, are known for writing extraordinarily well-crafted, super tight, incredibly catchy, beautiful, yeah. intellectual, like pop songs, essentially. Yeah. And uh, Ignore Grief doesn't really have anything to do with that kind of music. But I would say that his, you know, I mean, he's been making records almost as long as I've been alive. So his, I mean, his just mastery of <laughs> recording and music generally certainly, certainly shaped it. Um, I mean, he he played in those bands, but, you know, um, he's he's done many 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 other things. No, oh, absolutely. Do you think that um, his well, what made you decide to work with him in the first place? When I was a kid, um, it's uh, I it's by, I'm not I still don't totally understand how this occurred. When I was very like a teenager, I played in a band with him and several other very famous okay. kind of '80s new wave people. Somebody from Paul Rosser from the Screamers, oh, wow. Josie oh, Cotton, wow. who had like a top ten new wave hit. Um, David, obviously, uh, Geza X, who was the Germs and Dead Kennedys producers, and had this incredibly abrasive, bizarre band called the Mommy Men, who were sort of like Sonic Youth before Sonic Youth was Sonic Youth. Um, sure. uh, and so somehow, I mean, they were all you know a, adults, and I was a kid. Somehow, I was playing in a band with them. Um, and um, long story, whatever, I moved and wasn't around them anymore and then i i ran into david a, a couple of years ago in los angeles and i hadn't seen him in you know decades mm. i ran into him at an art gallery and he, you know i always loved him and he was always very kind to me and um, we became social friends again um you know i'd go to over his house for dinner and things like that and then he he recorded on oh no the record we did before ignore mm. grief and then i asked him if he wanted to start touring with us and uh, plan this next record, and he very graciously agreed. Um, so it was a, a very long arc. I mean, I've known him for, you know, the majority of, of my life, but it's wow. only been the last couple of years that we've become like true colleagues, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, well, fantastic. And speaking of, oh no, how would you say this album is different to that, to that record? Oh, uh, qu quite. <laughs> I mean, this is my assessment, and also I'm the least qualified person in the entire world to talk about Shushu records only because I have no perspective on them whatsoever. So uh, take any of this with a, a, a kilograms of salt. Um, uh, oh no, to me was uh, essentially all of all of the it's all it's all songs, not pop songs necessarily, but songs with a uh, you know a fairly lineated structure yeah, um yeah 
uh, and all of uh, you know, you know, you, I mean, you know, like verse, chorus, bridge types of songs, yeah, of course, more, yeah. more or less the majority of them. Mm. Uh, and uh, there was, it was also a record of duets. Uh, every song it was me singing with one with one other uh, uh, incredibly qualified and generous guest. Mm. Um, Ignore grief aesthetically is uh, no re no really linear or narrative song structure. It's uh, half of the song is um, this is of course just my own description, um, kind of post-industrial experimental songs with a fairly abstract structure, all electronic music and percussion. And the other half is um, uh, kind of um, small ensemble, uh, modern classical pieces um, with uh, uh, with not a, with no real sort of linear um, kind of Western folk, Western yeah. rock and roll style uh, structure. Mm. What made you decide to go down this more experimental route? Uh, I mean, we have a fairly broad palette of musical interests. <laughs> we had a booking agent that asked us if we were trying to destroy our band, um, <laughs> no, uh, which is a fair question. I mean, not consciously, but um, I mean, we've made a lot of very bad decisions, so maybe unconsciously we are. Um, I, it's, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not really something, I mean, this is going to make me sound like an ass. It's not really something we choose to do. Yeah. Uh, we're very much of collectively of the mindset that music is something that you allow into your consciousness and into your heart. And sure. um, it is something that you follow the directions of rather than something you try to control. Um, and at the time we started working on it, um, that that's, that's what came out. That was what the, the goddess of music decided we were going to be working on. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of the album art, there's a, so the album cover, if you guys don't know, it's a white bat, I believe, on a black background. Is that uh, meaningful in any way? What's the story behind that? It's a, it's a medieval image. Um, we don't know anything about the history of it. Um, we tried to find some things about it. Uh, at the, we later, <laughs> when we released the album cover, several people showed us that they had a tattoo of it. Um, wow. So apparently it's okay. a, more, a more popular image than we had, it's good. Than we had known. Uh, I mean, bummer for them. I mean, they might think the record <laughs> sucks and then they... <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't know how David feels about this. Um, Angela and I are both fairly obsessed with uh, European medie religious medieval art. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, at the time we were working on the record, we're ingesting as as, as much of it as we could. Um, so it's, essentially, it's just, just a reflection. I mean, the record is, in, to me, very, very, very dark, yeah. Uh, yeah. as is a lot of the, uh, the art of that period for uh, fairly obvious reasons. Um, so it's 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 essentially like an own. It's it's hard to necessarily quantify how that. That art was really affecting uh, how the record turned out, but that was the majority of what we were looking at while we were working on it. So obviously, it did yeah. subconsciously. So it's it's a nod to what that was, uh, what that art was giving to us at the time. No, absolutely. And the title of the record, "Ignore Grief," is there any story behind that? Uh, let me try and not spend forty minutes explaining this. So. Um, Half of the songs on the record, a lot of some very horrible things happen to people that we know and care about at, during the course of working on this record. Yeah. So, astonishingly horrible things. Mm. Um, uh, so half of the record are half of the record are pieces that describe those situations, um, and um, half of the record are. At, at the time we were working on this record, we also became very interested in there's like a late 50s, early 60s rock and roll subgenre called teen tragedy songs, which are like the most famous one being like leader, leader of the pack, which yeah. they're, they're essentially songs where two teenagers are in love, one or both of them dies. Mm. Um, and there's probably 30 or 40 of them that were became actual hits. It was kind of a strange phenomenon um, in that period. We became very interested in those also, hmm. um, as as big fans of of uh, 
early rock and roll um, and um, uh, early R and B. Um, so, so half of half of the songs on this record. Sorry, this is this is really convoluted. Go ahead, take but time. Half of the songs on the record uh, are illustrations of these of these events that happen to people that we know and or care about. And they were all of these events for us emotionally were quite overwhelming. Um, so the other half of the songs were sort of a dive into uh, what we were getting from teen tragedy songs. Sure. We don't know anything about the history of the teen tragedy songs. Um, and they were all written by different individuals. If they were completely imaginary, they're just trying to write a hit or whatever, or if they came from something real that happened to them, or if they were a means of coping. So um, we we wrote then five songs, which were illustrations of imaginary but horrible events, sort of following the idea of teen tragedy songs. None of them are really teen tragedy songs, sure. following you know like two teenagers in love, one falls off a motorcycle or whatever. Um, but they're imaginary songs of loss, mm -hmm. and those were essentially writing those was essentially a means for us to cope with the uh, actual loss that we were we were dealing with. Yeah. Um, and so uh, in, a, in a way, making this record was not necessarily an attempt to genuinely ignore grief because we clearly didn't ignore it. We mm. spent two years thinking about it all the time. Um, but it, it almost like the concept of ignoring grief is, is almost just, you know, you mm. we had enough. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's not, it's not, it's, it's, it's almost, it's almost a, a backhanded comment. It's impossible to ignore it. It's, no. I mean, it's silly to ignore it. There's no conceivable way to ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you ignore it, it's, it's only going to become worse for you because you are not processing it. Um, so I don't, it's trying to exist in, in, in both ways at the same time, both ignoring it, i.e. trying to get on with the rest of your life, but it is constantly bubbling under you and there's no way to necessarily escape it. No, absolutely. And you mentioned um, sort of how this was maybe a means of, of coping. Do you think that by creating this music and by through your live performances, um, there's maybe a catharsis effect? Do you feel better after putting this out there? It's not really catharsis in so far. It's not really like a release. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I've, I've said this a lot of times. I mean, it's been a big part of, of a main part of this of Shushu. Sure. Uh, it's, it's really just a way to organize Mm -hmm. um i mean i'm a nut like a, i'm completely out of my mind i and really having music is the one thing that makes me be a functional human being sure. um it gives it, they're uh, rotten things horrible feelings have a place to go that is other than just self-destruction yeah um so it's more of an organizing technique uh or a I don't want to, it doesn't, it doesn't really supplant anything, but it, it, um, it gives, it gives, it gives those events a function. Yeah. Um, so it's not like, it's not like they go away, but they turn into something that has the potential to be constructive, mm. um, rather than, you know, jumping up a bridge or whatever. Yeah. No. So it's like getting your thoughts in order, basically getting. It's, it's, it's put, it's turning those thoughts into something other, other than, uh, um other than destruction yeah fair enough can't, can't fold that um what else do we have um and you're obviously going on tour uh in the u.s later this year i think um, yeah and then uh you're you're up right after that we should have those dates in the next week or so fantastic people are excited to hear that um what can people expect from your upcoming sh shows for the album uh it will be loud we <laughs> We'll play the best that we can every night. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say. We just started practicing yesterday, so okay. um, there'll be, you know, I mean, we have we've been around for twenty years, so we have a lot of a fairly deep back catalog. Mm. Oops, you know, I don't know. Just say some no, songs from the new record, some yeah. old songs. Um, it's a it's the first long tour that we've ever done with David. I'm ex very excited about doing that. I don't really. I'm, and Angela is back on tour. She hasn't been able to tour for several years. Mm. Um, so she's she's touring again. I'm uh, this. It's really my favorite lineup that we have ever had. Um, and there's no kind way to say it, but there's never been a lineup that we had where there wasn't someone in the band who I thought was a complete dick uh, or made me completely insane. 
Right. Um, so this is the first time there's ever, except that brief period, it was one year where only Angela and I were touring together. Mm -hmm. We get along very, very well. So other than that one year, there's always been someone in the band who um, I uh, made me wish I were dead. So thankfully <laughs> that doesn't exist. Yeah. This is, I'm, I'm looking forward to touring. I, I never liked touring. I mean, I like playing, but I don't like being on tour. This is the first time I've ever looked forward to touring. And it is uh, hands, I mean, we, we played, I think four shows or something, mm. just just one offs. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, after you about two weeks into a tour, you start sounding really good generally because you played a lot. Um, and I'm I'm very excited to hear what this particular lineup uh, sounds like once we've gotten completely greased up. No, absolutely. Um, sounds exciting. Um, and speaking of touring, do you ever? So obviously, some of your songs are very quiet. So like "Sad Pony Gorilla Go," um, very acoustic, very sort of strip back do you ever find it difficult to translate that to like a live setting no uh i like playing i mean i i know that i said that this tour would be loud but we are playing a couple of very quiet songs yeah um i, I think this has only come from experience i mean just we, you know we've been on tour for 20 years i found that if we're playing something quiet and the audience is being noisy the best thing to do is just to become quieter rather than try and rather than trying to fight the audience um it's a matter of essentially forcing the issue <laughs> like this song is occurring whether you like it or not it, you know you chose you chose to be here um you can leave if you don't want to hear something quiet no um and I, you know, I mean, also, I mean, also at this point, again, because we've been around for a long time, and people know what to expect. I mean, our quiet songs tend to be very painfully quiet. Mm. Um, so, I mean, when we when we first started playing, it was much more of a challenge because, you know, people didn't necessarily come on purpose. We'd be like, you know, the second of six bands playing or something like that. So people didn't really uh, weren't there necessarily. But. Um, also, you know, we don't play big enough shows where it's, it's not like 10,000 people there or something. <laughs> huh. So it's, you know, it's, it's really, it's really not, uh, the, the, the stars generally seem to align. Oh, that's, that's really good to hear. Um, has COVID changed um, the way you tour or the way you make music at all? Uh, I mean, it was two, a two year break from touring, which I didn't realize I really needed until I had yeah. it. Um, It really didn't all that much aside from just we weren't touring constantly. Uh, I mean, I kind of like I said, we've always had a home studio. Yeah, so we, did, we just worked on, a, we just recorded a lot more than we have ever done. Um, we did start a subscription, like a lot of bands, which which we've continued to do. People still seem to be interested in that. So that was something that's new. And it forced me to get my uh, recording engineering chops a lot more developed, which I've appreciated. Just we needed to, you know, put stuff out every single month. So I just had to be a lot faster than I used to be. Um, but as far as the general process, really, really not so much. Yeah. I think if we didn't have a home studio, it probably would have greatly, but because it was, other than recording a whole lot more, it was kind of business as usual. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and your subscription service that's on Bandcamp, right? Uh, yeah, uh, she shoes 69. Yeah. Um, Classy. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> um, what did you, did you find that Bandcamp offered something that like classic streaming services didn't? Oh, uh, I mean, they have a subscription service. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, many artists have sort of started using that um, because they, they they get higher royalties, obviously, from Bandcamp than off um, Spotify. And, and Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's a different thing. I mean, on Spotify, I mean, you can release things on Spotify, but it's not, hmm. people don't necessarily, don't, it, it's not, this is a horrible word. It's not curated for very specific people yeah um i mean we the, the, the subscription thing it tends to be people who are uh you know more interested in shishu than the oh. average than the average bird and i think because of that more willing to come along for any uh risks that we might take mm, um, uh, and yeah so obviously spotify has been criticized a lot for its uh, model of streaming and everything rightfully by musicians um but also Ticketmaster recently kind of got into a lot of shit for um not for basically basically jacking up the prices for um very popular events have you what's your experience with Ticketmaster what's your take on all of that 
I don't really go to shows, so I don't, <laughs> it doesn't really affect me as, an, okay. as a music fan. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's just, that's like a shitty corporation, like every shitty corporation. Yeah. Um, you know, they're greedy assholes. Um, every, I mean, it's, it's their job to fuck people over and make more money for people who already have a ton of money. I mean, it's in the news because very popular people are like Taylor Swift are rightly complaining about it. Yeah. Uh, and I, um, I mean, she's a whatever manufactured pop star, but I appreciate that it takes a lot for somebody who's in her position mm. um, to, you know, to, to punch up essentially. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, not, not a lot of pop stars have the guts to do something like that, but then again, also she's like the most popular pop star in the world. So she could kind of say whatever she wants with no consequences <laughs> to, to Ticketmaster. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, it's good that it's, you know, it's, it's good that it's, it's part of a, a it's part of a dialect but also you know i mean like going to shows is fun but it's really like there's bigger fish to fry in the world <laughs> you know i mean if your ticket is five pounds more i mean obviously that sucks and it's a pain in the ass but you know I, off the top of my head i could easily name fifteen thousand other things that are more important yeah i mean I, I will listen. sorry just kidding no <laughs> um yeah i mean have you ever you've I assume, I assume not have any major difficulties with it, you know, getting tickets yourself. Um, I mean, as a, as like for me buying a ticket as to a, go to a um, show? No, as an artist, sorry. Oh, no, we're not really popular enough that it makes a difference. I mean, I mean, like a big show for us is like 600 people or something like that. So. It's still good. That's good. I mean, I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm not complaining, but yeah, it's not yeah. like, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, if like 80,000 people come to your show, then something like Ticketmaster really makes a big difference. But I think. For us as a band, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, fair. Um, and sort of in recent years, I mean, this is my perspective. Um, I think you guys have really, really blown up over social media and through um, communities like the, I don't know if you're familiar with, but I, I call it the music nerd community, which is like the sort of online music discussion community. You did a talk with the Music Discussion Society. That's very much that kind of clique. Um, what's your experience with um, sort of that online music community? I, um, every, everybody that we have had an interaction with has been incredibly supportive and sweet to us. We're oh. very, very, very fortunate and very, uh, grateful to, to anybody who takes the time to check out what we're doing. Um, I'm not personally online all that often, so I don't, I'm not really privy to exactly what's going on, but, um, when somebody reaches out to us more directly, um, uh again we just feel feel very 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 thankful um the the every single band we have ever toured with has said we have the nicest and coolest audiences they have ever played for it happens every single time um and i totally agree um uh yeah we um we we owe we owe people a lot oh, that's really sweet i'm really glad to hear that um Speaking of bands you toured with, bands you collaborated with, is there anyone that you haven't collaborated with yet, but that you'd like to work with? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, there's, there's not going to happen, you know. <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, like big heroes of mine, like, you know, like uh, Diamond de Galas or I just like know about or, you know, uh, uh, you know, Nick Cave or somebody like that. Mm. Um, but I mean, but, you know, but we have, we have collaborated with many other heroes of mine too. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and in the interim, some of them have we've gotten to be very good friends with. We, um, I don't like hearing no from somebody doesn't really bother me all that much. So we just, we just tend to ask people a lot that we admire if they'll work with us. And, you know, nine out of 10 people say they're too busy or they don't know who we are. They just mm -hmm. ignore us. But occasionally, you know, somebody who is profoundly meaningful to us says yes. And, and um, and uh, you know, dreams come true. Yeah, I mean, this interview's happening, so I can confirm that. We've emailed about hundreds of people, barely any replies. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, do you, I guess we've got a bunch of miscellaneous questions here. Um, so you've previously covered the music of Twin Peaks. You've also co-written the music for the film, How to Talk to Girls at Parties. Would you consider scoring another film in the future? Or how was what was the experience of doing that? Oh yeah, I mean it's I I am uh, an 
Angela, David, and I are all deep cinema nerds. Um, so, I, uh, yeah, I, I would, I, I would, I would love to. Yeah, we, we've done, we've done a few very, very, very small experimental films um, that I really enjoyed doing. And um, but yeah, we'd, in, in, in a heartbeat, we would. Absolutely. Um, one of the comparing questions... those two worlds is is a is a true delight. Oh, definitely, definitely. One of the questions we got asked is, "What is your favorite David Lynch film?" So I wanted to ask you that. Um, it's not really. I mean, it's it's unfair to say season three of Twin Peaks because it's not a film; it's more of an epic. But he yeah. considered each episode essentially as making a single film. Um, sure. So, uh, I, I, you know, I would say that. No, I mean that's a good pick. That's a good pick. Um, what else do we have? Yes. Um, I so recently, obviously, this is a bit of a departure, but recently there's been a lot of development in AI that can make images, lyrics, music, all of that. Um, is it worth pursuing that? Is it worth making music with AI robots? I mean, would I do it? I mean, is there any value in the music that's made from like? I, don't, I mean, probably not now. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's probably fairly terrible still, thankfully. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I fucking hate my phone and I hate computers, so I would probably never personally do it. Sure. But if somebody played me an incredible song and it was just on its face incredible, um, then, I mean, what am I, you know, if, if it is inherently great, then yeah. I suppose the source is irrelevant. Mm. Um, this is a, this is some deep, Music yeah, we, so existential stuff. Uh, well, I mean, I guess not. I mean, so do you know who Eric Burden is, the singer of the Animals? Uh, yeah. So he, do you know the band the Monkeys? Oh, so the yeah. Monkeys, for the uninitiated, were essentially this like manufactured like TV show pop yeah. band that a corporation put together. But they were all actually kind of halfway decent musicians, and they, basically, they knew their records were made by committee. But there was essentially really solid pop songs, yeah. and they got a lot of shit. The Monkeys got a lot of shit in the press. And at one point, Eric Burden, the lead singer of the animal, said essentially what I just said about AI. It's just like, mm. their songs are good. Who cares where they come from? I just like this as a song. Absolutely. Um, and until I actually hear a song by AI and I can deal with the emotional heart stomp that it is that a pointless robot made it, yet I'm still enjoying it. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. For now, I'd, I'll be magnanimous and say, go, little robots, go. But I may not feel that way in the future. Well, fair enough. I mean, it's... Uh... It's How do you surprising. feel about it? I mean, you're probably, I mean, I'm guessing by your face, you're considerably younger than I am. <laughs> you have to deal with it a lot longer than I will. What do you think about it? It's scary. I mean, um, you've heard of ChatGPT, I'm assuming, right? The sort of text, ChatGPT. It's a uh, sort of, so you feed it a prompt uh, and then it throws up whatever you've asked it to do. So I, a few weeks ago, asked it to make a Depeche Mode song and it made a Depeche Mode. It gave me the lyrics to a Depeche Mode song. And it sounded exactly like a Depeche Mode song. Wow. Mildly terrifying. But wow, I don't like that at all. Okay, I take it back. Some I, little robots, please jump into the desert and stay there until the sun cooks. <laughs> cooks yeah, I mean, yeah. Wow, I don't like that at all. I didn't know that was a thing. No, yeah. I mean, people have started using it to um, for assignments, for job interviews and stuff, which is a little bit terrifying, but that's someone else's issue. Um, well, well, good luck future humans yeah yeah i mean I mean, people are starting to adapt to it but hopefully yeah i mean i guess that's true i mean it's like any other you know you know humans are great we always do a good job so i'm not worried about this at all oh no absolutely um okay i think we'll we've got about five minutes left i'm gonna move to some of the questions we got submitted so these are sort of more all over the place but um we got some quite Quite great questions asked actually. First one, what was it I like? Take it back. Humans are great at asking questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. Yeah. In in two years, we'll have a robot doing everything here and then I'll just leave. Um so <laughs> these are this this is infinity thumbs down. <laughs> <laughs> Be cheaper for everyone else. Um, so our first question is what was it like working with Mitski? Oh, it wasn't it, it we didn't really work together so much. It was as as is often the case with people uh doing stuff on a deadline is um that uh i wrote a song for the movie you mentioned how to touch a girl's party for john cameron mitchell He's a wonderful person and he said he sort of gave me the parameters for what he wanted it to sound like 
And then he said, we're going to have Mitski sing it. So I kind of tried to write a melody that I thought she could, she would do well with. And I mean, she, she added a lot to it, but it was just, I sent them the song and she recorded it someplace else and we got it back. Like I didn't really ever meet her or talk to her or anything like that, but I think she did an excellent job. Oh, no, absolutely. Did you listen to her music at all? Um, I have heard it a few times. It's, um, I understand why people are moved by it. Hmm. And I, I have a lot of respect for it. It's, it's not really so much like to my taste as an individual. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I completely understand why someone would, would get something from it. And I, 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 um, as I said, I have a lot of respect for how she conducts herself and what she's doing. I think she's a great musician. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I absolutely agree. Um, someone wrote a little little paragraph here. It was quite cute. After listening to your song Jennifer Lopez, I thought of Bjork's Pluto because of the very really chaotic instrumentals and the freeing nature of dancing or exploding. Does this connection make sense to you? That was the, Jennifer Lopez was actually the first Shushu song that we wrote, um, and at the time uh, I was a big Bjork fan. So it, I mean, I I don't. It was a long time ago, so I don't remember if I was consciously thinking about Bjork. Yeah. But I did used to have a Bjork poster on my wall when I wrote that song. So, okay. <laughs> so she was in there somewhere. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and they say they're very excited for the new album. Um, what's been the hardest song for you to record throughout your career? Oh. Um, all of Girl with Basket of Fruit, which was a record we did in 2019, was really Diff, technically difficult to work on um yeah that record was a beast to put together the whole thing was tough if, uh, did you know what I mean, you... not 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 in, in in an interpersonal way but just in a, in a in a technical way we tried to do a lot of things we had never done before hmm. and they were all pretty challenging for us that's fine it worked out it worked out um Thanks. So uh, we also got to ask, what's your favorite album and song you've recorded? Probably. Oh, question. I can't say that. <laughs> it'll. It, I mean, I ha I do have one, but I'm afraid that if I say it, it'll make all the other songs sad. That I don't love them enough. I don't think so. I don't think it necessarily. I'll think it in my mind. If you, <laughs> you have ESP, you know the answer. I'm thinking it right now. Okay, that's as far as I'll go with the song. <laughs> well, if if anyone tuning in does think that, let us know. Keep uh, it to yourself. Yeah, keep if you it find out if you have ESP and you know my favorite Shushu song, keep it yeah. to yourself. <laughs> it's an important secret. Um, what's your price process for writing lyrics and song titles? Oh, uh, it's different. The process for song titles and the process for lyrics are really different. Um, song titles, not always. Oh God, this is so ridiculous. Sorry. No. Song titles. Not in every case, but sometimes I'll consider almost as their own, like a little tiny poem or whatever. Yeah, of course. Um, of course. That they will be some very personal commentary on the overall meaning of the song, or maybe just what was happening in the moment that the song was being written that has really nothing to do with the actuality of mm -hmm. the meaning of the song. Um, so uh, if there are any song titles that seem to have nothing to do with the song, then that's the case. Right. To me, there's this there this very personal mm. little note or whatever. Um and you know, and then otherwise, you know, titles would just take for some relevant part of the song, so like most songs. Um lyrics lately, this was not always the case, and it's not the it, and occasionally a whole set of lyrics will just be beamed down to me from the universe. Yeah. And I'm lucky enough to have a pen in my hand and write them down and they're all there. That happens very, very rarely, but I'm mm. uh, excited and sort of astonished when it does. But generally it's, um, we work on the music and then during the course of working on the music, we'll just take, have notebooks and notebooks filled with lines or thoughts or maybe fragments of lyrics um, yeah. that are collected at the point that the, songs are being written so the sort of emotional state of the collection of the lyrics is similar to what's going on in the songs but they're not necessarily i guess uh i don't know allocated for a particular destination and then uh when the music is all written they'll start kind of going through the lyrics and start kind of the you know collection of you know and 
yeah, ninety five percent of them are garbage. But just like finding what seems to be what the relevant connections are, True. Um, and how the you know, and if a set of them seems to make sense, sort of match the, you know what's going on in a particular song, kind of marry those two things together. Okay. Um, and then also lately, and this happened on Ignore Grief. And, it's and we're working on a new record right now. It's happening on that record too. Um, David is also a very experienced and excellent lyricist um, and writes really like completely unrelated to how I work on things. Um, like in and, and really almost like technical ways, like he uses a lot of very formalized meter, a lot of uh, old poetic, you know, like Victorian poetic forms, like um, and how he'll organize things and the things that are here things about and are interesting to him aren't necessarily the things that I would put in songs there. I mean, it's, I still find them fascinating, um, but it's just not things that I would necessarily go to. So uh, David has also been writing lyrics periodically. Um, you know, I'll just say, I'm stuck. Can you send me some lyrics? You know, I'll send him like a melody or something. Can you send something that matches with that? And then he'll come back to you. So we've been collaborating also, which is new. And I, I'm uh, excited to be able to do that with him. It's, mm -hmm. it's taking the lyrics down a very, not in every case, but in a lot of cases, down a very different path, which is which is good. No, it's exciting. Um, so we're at forty-five, but we started a bit late, so I'll keep it for another minute or two. Um, I've got one or two questions, if that's okay with you, and then we'll um, do that. So one question that we got asked that I thought was extremely interesting because it taught me a new word. What brings you comfort in the ephemerality of life? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. Kind of uninteresting things. I like going for walks. <laughs> I like cats. <laughs> I like chocolate. Um, I'm close. You know, my family was a total nightmare forever, but now things are actually pretty good. So oh. I'm close with my family again, which is nice. I like looking at trees. You know, <laughs> it's important. I have a stuffed animal collection. Oh. <laughs> No, the, the, I mean, uninteresting things are sometimes the most important ones. Um, and uh, sort of to end on a kind of relevant note to us, you've, um, so obviously in early years, radio was, actually, no, that's the wrong question. Um, has, have you found the radio, maybe specifically independent radio, has had an influence on your career? Oh, absolutely. I mean, especially uh, where I grew up, uh, in Los Angeles, and I live in the Bay Area, which is like San Francisco, Oakland, uh, San Jose. Um, both of those regions have incredibly rich college radio scenes. Okay. okay. Um, the Bay Area, maybe not so much now, but when the band started, I think there was like 10 college radio stations or something. Some, uh, And uh, there's a couple in Los Angeles which are still really vibrant, KPFK and KXLU um and all all of those all of those stations uh you know exposed me to, to things i never would have heard otherwise hmm. um the uh, kpfk uh i think God, i think i was like 12 or something and was starting to get totally obsessed with music but it was just in a i mean i you know like in a top 40 or whatever i mean there was a lot of a lot of good stuff but i was kind of hoping for something more and just slowly turning the dial yeah. and uh on sundays they had like a like a dub and scone reggae show and i had at that time had never heard anything like that and it was sort of the beginning of oh there's other music other than top yeah. 40 and that was that was the first music that i got into that wasn't you know uh, you know whatever on on the church so uh yeah it, it to totally and then from there started looking a lot more deeply in it and i had it you know dj on college station wow. um, and, uh, to work as an engineer and for some like live music on a college station uh uh kzsu at stanford um oh, wow. so yeah i i am a deep, a, deep, a deep fan of college radio well wow. we're really glad to hear that's what we try and do um but yeah we just want to thank you for um this talk and this interview we really really appreciate it um i'm sure everyone who's on it would also like to thank you your new album thank you very very much out uh march 3rd you can listen to the first single may bay baby i'm saying that right maybe baby okay um, all right you can, you can listen to that out now. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Remember to listen to Oxide Radio. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Have a good day. You too.